thank you for having the opportunity to, to present this talk here. So it's again about grain growth and some phase field modeling. But our, however, I have to state I'm not at all the expert in phase field modeling. I feel like I should absolutely go to this school September in the Alps. Uh, so the guy who has done the phase field modeling is Yin Sang, a student which did his PhD with uh, DTU physics in, in Denmark and Northwestern University. So the supervisors were Peter Voorhees and Henning Poulsen. So I have just been involved in the, in the experimental part, like watching the grains to grow. And Yin has done all the job of trying to model and compare and draw some conclusions. So what we see here on the slide, do you know what this is? What could this be? So it is like a rotational symmetry around the horizontal axis. So it's a parabolic shaped element, it's aluminum. So we use it as a lens for X-rays. So why concave? The refractive index of X-rays is below one. They call it the refractive index decrement. There's a reason for that because it's not of order of, like uh, in visible light it would be 1.5 or something. Here we are 10 to the minus six below one. So it's a tiny effect and you need many of those lenses to have a notable effect of focusing, but still it works and we use it. And by the way, like this is a, I suppose now I'm using terms and lens I'm not an expert in, probably dynamic crystallization has happened as you have stamped a sheet of one millimeter thick aluminum to end up with something like 100 micrometer waste and well, it's fully recrystallized. We can look at the grain sh shapes here, but there must have been recrystallization and growth during this process because it heats a lot and it deforms a lot. So this is a whole topic in itself. And by the way, it's also interesting to, in to look into this grain structure because like if there is strong diffraction events as you use it as a lens, so you have contrast in your images, it's not an ideal lens. So we, maybe there's something to be optimized in terms of microstructure of these, uh, of these lenses. So. Um, does this work? Mm -hmm. I mean, ah, it's the <laughs> wrong one. Okay, so this one. <laughs> so what will I talk about? I will give a brief, like in a nutshell, how, does, how do these techniques work? How do we get these three-dimensional pictures of grains? And we use, like in our case, a technique called X-ray diffraction contrast tomography. We use BRAC diffraction. Look at BRAC diffracted beams, like the pro real space projections to reconstruct in a tomographic way the, the grain shapes and orientations. And then I show like two applications, like a kind of continuation of Eubin's talk. If you have seen one of the first talks on Monday, so we also combined his characterization, which is we had like low micro scanning maps of local deformation and local strains. And so we have continued to grow these grains. And the second study I will focus on is like this pure grain growth and like in pure iron and some conclusions. So how does it work? We have like a polycrystalline sample volume with a, illuminated with an extended monochromatic beam and we have a high resolution detector system. So typically this is a, like a, there's a scintillator screen which transforms X-rays into visible light and we look with a light optical microscope at the screen. And the cameras that we use, well, they have a fixed size, maybe 2000 by 2000. So what do we see? So we see the transmitted beam in the center of the detector you see some shadows, like if grains rotate in and out, so we are turning around this vertical axis, a full turn. Grains rotate in and out the diffraction conditions and they create this, um, like these diffracted beams here. Oh, this one doesn't work. That you see coming and, and disappearing. So we do a full turn and we do it in, in very fine steps. And then like the, what do we have to do? So we have collected, uh, sorry, coming back. We have collected, I'm getting confused with these two pointers. <laughs> we have collected a large stack of images, a lot of diffraction spots, which we don't know where, which grain they belong to. So what we have to do, we, we will segment each of these spots, try to isolate like what is the grain center of mass position, the shape aspect ratios. And then we try, so we segment them. And then we try to find pairs of spots, why? Because if you think instead of the sample rotating, think yourself being the sample, you will see the synchrotron and the detector rotating around you. And what is like, if you now look and or think about a HKL diffraction spot, if you are rotating, like if the beam is perpendicular to your rotation axis, you will observe this 
same HKL, like the minus H, minus K, minus, minus L spot, again after 180 degree rotation. So if you are able to find this or identify the same spot, which we try to identify by means of what is the intensity, what is the shape, the aspect ratios. So if you find such a Friedel pair, we call it, you have gained a lot because you know if you draw the line between these two spots, you know that the grain must lie on this connecting line. And what remains to be done is then to find consistent pairs of Friedel pairs which cross in the center of mass position of, of the grain. So once you have done this, this, we call this the indexing step, you know what is the center of mass of the grain. And since you have determined a couple of diffraction vectors, you can also calculate the orientation, the grain average orientation of this particular grain. Once you know this orientation and position, you can go back and forward simulate your experiment and you will find in this huge stack of, let's say, 3,000 images, all the spots belonging to one and the same grain. So each of these diffraction spots is nothing else than a, a two-dimensional projection, like you have a three-dimensional grain volume, and you're looking at real space, high-resolution detector, one micrometer pixels, at real space images of these grains. So you have projection images, and saying projection images means you could do tomographic reconstruction. This is what we do, grain by grain, we reconstruct the three-dimensional shape, and at the end, we assemble them into a common sample volume to give a three-dimensional grain map where we know for each of the grains the average orientation and its outline. And well, this one, it works in some cases, not in all. I will come back to the limitations, but it can cover quite a range of different conditions, actually. They can go from very heavy, very small grain, in this case, we have a very small voxel size of, of 0.3 micrometers in small grains. Or the other extreme, like a factor of 100, 100 in, in, in pixel size of the detector and very large grains. This is snow, wet snow, spring snow, not yet. We have to wait a little bit. But, but what you can't do <laughs> is to combine both resolutions. So if you have a bimodal grain size distribution, this is something we can't do because we, we have to adapt our detector pixels to somehow to the grain and sample size. And so you can't have like very high spatial resolution with such a big sample or with big grains. It somehow scales with the grain size, so there's limitations. And we cannot go below this particular size, so we're already at the limit. The X-ray imaging detector, is like the imaging is done with a scintillation screen, and this conversion process has a point spread function, and there's physical limits. We cannot go beyond like for higher energies, it's even worse than that. We, we cannot claim to be better than one micrometer spatial resolution. So remembering Mark's talk on Monday, we are a factor of 1,000 at least uh, away from what can be seen in transmission electron microscopy. So be aware that we are looking at very large, like at, at a rough scale. But still, we think we can do something interesting. So one short excursion, and I will keep it short here. I said there's this limitation in, in, in how much a detail we can see. However, because what was the, the thing? We, we had to share the whole detector screen for having the direct beam and capturing like this day by show, like the, all the diffracted beams around it. So all the area was consumed by a compromise somehow to capture a couple of HKL families on the same screen. However, there's a trick you can play to zoom into an individual grain. And the trick to play is that um, you have to align the diffraction vectors, like one plane normal of a grain, parallel to the rotation axis of your setup. So as you rotate now, the diffraction vector, if you have inclined it with this base tilt here, with the break angle with respect to the incoming beam, so this diffraction vector will always be in diffraction condition. And now, if you, if you start to, oops, there is a movie somewhere, exactly. So as you now start to rotate, well, the grain stays in diffraction condition. You see in the diffracted beam, if you place a detector here, you can kind of zoom in with the highest possible resolution of this detector to watch more detail. And you can actually see there is some internal structure inside the grain which can be seen. So that is an interesting <laughs> variant if you want to look with higher resolution. But still, we are limited to this kind of one micrometer pixel size unless you would continue to do playing some tricks and put like a magnifying lens, like an X-ray optic, to form a magnified image of this beam. But I won't talk about this variant of the technique. So why it's interesting? Because you have at the same time absorption imaging. You can see some, like this is the absorption, a slice through the sample. It was an aluminum polycrystal, a multi-crystal, large grains. 
There are some iron-rich precipitates, which you can kind of guess with these white dots. And you see them very well. Now, this is the reconstruction, like a slice through this grain reconstructed, the outline of the, like, the, the grain boundary. This is the outer surface of the sample here. And you see these dots. Like this is the strain fields around, <coughs> around inclusions that show up somehow in diffraction conditions. Very qualitative. They simply serve as, or they highlight the presence of some strain and pr pr particles inside. So it could be interesting to, well, pinning or things like this could possibly be watched at this length scale. But be aware, it's at least it's one micrometer limited. Right? Now, UBIM has done some tests or tried. We tried to use these techniques to study recrystallization. The problem is that, well, you are in the middle of a deformed matrix and we can't look at deformed material. It's diffuse. Our algorithm, at least in our, with our full field illumination approach, we can't reconstruct what is deformed matrix. However, we do see like the recrystallized grains. We can reconstruct them. This is again a re like 3D rendering of a partially recrystallized sample. And we see like these recrystallized grains appearing. And Yubin and the student have done some comparison between EBSD and our grain size distributions. And the message is, well, OK, like at the at starting from about 10 microns onwards, the two distributions seem to match. We are kind of not sensitive enough to look at at the very small nuclei. So this is the clear limitation of the approach here. I think I have summarized it in these slides. You remember maybe Eubin's picture. He has mapped this Lowry microdiffraction around this initial state here. A few nuclei have been detected after the first step. He started to show you some analysis of well, what could be the reasons why this grain grows and the other one not. So we have taken the same, very same sample and continued to heat it on our setup. And this is the evolution. You see a big jump because at some point it was stagnating. We couldn't see any like, limited beam times. So we raised temperature and then all of a sudden it was unpinned and, and started to grow a lot. But still we have quite some information from the 3D Lowell micro scanning about local dislocation densities and this, uh, misorientations in the deformed matrix, which we, we don't see in this experiment. So it could be of interest to think about if you have ideas. So now I switch to the to the, the last topic, which is the grain growth observation. So no recrystallization. We are already starting from a recrystallized grain structure. We are watching grain growth. And we had in the beginning something like 1,400 grains. It's pure iron. The sample is mounted on, like this is the sample, about 400 micrometer diameter iron. It's, we can move it uh, like a retractable furnace coming up and down. So we do 15 cycles of annealing. It's there's some forming gas to limit oxidation during the experiment. I won't go into details here. I'm running late in time. So there is a, a first paper about some statistical measures showing, well, what, how do these grain population evolve in terms of, well, the, like individual grain, like uh, the growth rates of individual grains, like, but, like one minute. Like big grains are supposed to grow, but you see both behaviors, like even in the big grains, you see some which decrease in the beginning, or the small grains, you find some which grow. So there's, there's, some, out, like there's some variability. It is not the mean field uh, behavior that you would expect from a classical mean field model. So the challenges Yin, the student, had to face is to make like these reconstructions. They are not perfect. You, you may notice there are some white lines. There are some black areas. White means two. Well, we reconstruct independently each of these grains. And then when we assemble them back, they might overlap locally because there's some inaccuracy in the reconstruction. And so this is how the white areas or black areas is where just we weren't able to fill the gap between two grains. And we have kind of to cheat and fill this, uh, these errors. <coughs> so Yin has done quite some good job in, in trying to do it as physical as possible. He came up with a phase field dilation model. The differences between a classical brute forward dilation to fill gaps or overlaps is shown here. It's of the order of, let's say, one plus minus one pixel. So we are not completely wrong, but there are some errors in these maps. You have to be aware. And uh, so what do we get? So this mesh has been, well, this is now after some smoothing. It's not the, the pixelated uh, reconstruction. Yin and, and colleagues have done some, some meshing and then smoothing of the mesh. And you can now watch this evolution, for example, a, a zoom onto uh, two grains. You see, for example, some topological transitions, like some facets disappearing over time. So it's interesting. You can even watch 
watch this in time. Let me see if I can get it running. Uh, yes, it runs. So you, well, for example, this crane here is disappearing over time. I will skip because I'm late. Uh, this movie here. Now the idea is you have like a very precise evolution, like relatively precise picture or a movie, three-dimensional movie of such a grain structure. Of course, it's appealing to, to think, well, can we model it at the same time? And then maybe can we learn or extract some hidden material parameters from it? This was the ambition. <laughs> so then attempt, like Yin has the, made it the attempt to fit what we call this reduced grain boundary, boundary mobilities. So mobility times energy or stiffness of the boundary as a function of five micro microscopic grain boundary parameters, so misorientation and inclination of the boundary. But, okay, so the idea is, I think, conceptually, you, you understand, you have an experimental movie, you have a phase field, you initialize the phase field with the initial start, starting, uh, like the observation of the experiment, and you try to mimic the experiment as it, as it continues. So now, I, this is where I don't know anything about it, but, but we have learned in the previous talk about this is a very simplistic, from what I now understand, <laughs> phase field model. There is um, no, it takes not into account game boundary inclination dependence. And during the fitting, he also, well, he tried to fit now these mobilities from running such a model and trying to adjust the mobilities. And you can show that, well, you can kind of fit them in individually and this is what he tried to do, Yin. So the, you see, like, the, the prediction of the model between one time step and, like, four time steps later of, of, the, of, of the experimental movie. The blue lines is the initial guess with a constant mobility. And then the evolution shows, I hope it's running, yes, that after a couple of iterations, like if you adjust, if you try to adjust these mobilities, even with this assumption of no inclination dependence, well, he, I don't know what it's worth or not, there are certainly the things to be, uh, which can be argued, it seems to, to fit very well. So maybe this inclination dependence <coughs> could be not the main factors. At least for this limited evolution range, like four time steps in this case, like the, the, the match for most of the grains is, is quite good. You, we see these topological transitions in the structures. Two bit surprising observations are that for two boundaries, which are very clear in misorientation and inclination space, this is there's, there's a, like the, this is just a slice through the different time steps, like the different colors are the different time steps for these two grains. <coughs> So it was like one pair of grains, which are certain like misorientation and inclination. And we have somewhere else in the microstructure, a very similar boundary, like a similar in terms of misorientation and inclination. And you see a huge variability of these mobilities. So some indication that it, well, it's not in, well, something seems to be unexpected, at least say it like this. And another example is that during topological changes, it's not shown here, there's a third grain which disappears. And at the moment the third grain disappears, there's a huge jump or a huge variability in the mobility or in, in, in these positions of the grain boundary. So it seems to be the mobility might be related to or influenced, strongly influenced by these transitions. So the conclusions which have been drawn is that well, the observed or fitted values from this type of fitting they scatter quite a lot over two, at least two orders of magnitude. And like looking at projections of this five-time parameter, five-dimensional parameter space, like ju just misorientation or just grain boundary um, misorientation or grain boundary inclination, the different colors are different values for this reduced mobility. But from this limited number of observations, at least there's no clear co uh, correlation which appears between this mobility, reduced mobility, and these five dimensional parameters. But, well, and also, surprisingly, for the same boundary, there's quite some variability in time. So the same boundary might have uh, like, this, uh, like a histogram of how much different boundaries 
change their mobility over time during this process. So to conclude, sorry I'm running late. I hope I have shown that um, there is some interest in using this technique. Also, there's clear limitations, being that first of all, you cannot go below one micrometer without using X-ray magnification. It works for grains which are at least 10 micrometer in size. We cannot go much below. It works for simple lattices. So ge geologists and mineralogists, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's like complicated crystal structures, we will not be able to look at them. We cannot look into plastically deformed materials or only limited, very limited deformations. <coughs> the number of grains that we illuminate simultaneously has to be between this, roughly this range, depending on deformation. So the, the less deformed, the more grains we can look at simultaneously. So grain growth in that sense is very good because they are all undeformed. We can look at large populations with a single scan. It's typically mono or maybe dual phase materials with limited texture and as I said before, monomodal grain size distributions. And it's not so easy to get very precise curvatures or these triple junction precise positions. And well, I have, I think, already discussed about this, just two words about what comes next or what could be the future. With this upgrade of the synchrotron sources, we see a 20 times increase in flux. So that could mean that we might be able to continue without, like do the observations switch out they were all done at the room temperature. We cycled the temperature for annealing. It might be possible to do it in situ, like at really staying at high temperature, provided we can construct a furnace which allows us to get very close to the sample. And scan times will come down to of order of minutes now with this, with this improved source. You can have more resolution by doing microscopy, but at the expense of temporal resolution. And well, <coughs> there's large data volumes to be processed and there's some time to be spent to learn how to use these tools. For that reason, um, uh, if, you, if you are still convinced you want to do it and you can apply, there's a new deadline coming up, but it, it's challenging and, and time consuming to do the analysis. And with this, I would, just on the last slide, there's this white stuff out here. If you color it in orientations, this looks like this. This is a recent season in, <coughs> in, in Grenoble, where we looked at snow temperature gradient metamorphism of snow. So as you put a strong gradient, whoop, uh, uh, so you see from the initially rounded grains, you start to form quite faceted grains and the structure seems to grow towards the bottom. This is because of the vapor transport through, uh, through the vapor phase. Thank you very much.